excuse me. Good evening, everybody. Um, just before we get on to the final part of the uh, on bank decision, um, just like to reiterate my thanks to uh, my sister Lucia for coming on yesterday doing a discussion. Um, and I must admit that um, it might have been a bit confusing when I put the slideshow and the music together um, asking about the cult. Um, hopefully we managed to answer some of those questions in the um, in, in the subsequent um, live chat that we did. Um, and I've just put another uh, slide video set to music out there asking the basic question, um, you know, what... Uh, what do we think is going to be the effect of all of these um, Netflix documentaries over the uh, over the course of well over over four years now? Hi Kim. Um, hopefully, it'll it'll have an effect. Hopefully, it'll it'll cause um, people to realise how up the food chain that they need to change change their act. And certainly I've watched all the way through the Innocence file. Um, so as this one is just a very short um, finish off of the decision, um, I've then found out um, some information that relates to obviously the first two um, episodes of the Innocence file. Anyway, we'll get onto that in, in, a, in a wee while. First of all, let's have a look at the, uh, the final part of the decision or shall i say the dissenting part of the uh, three judges that dissented <coughs> excuse me so here we go let's have a look at uh, brendan dassey um final part of the decision let me just check and make sure i'm always cautious about the fact that this is actually coming through okay um Keep an eye on it. So let's. Uh, just a little bit of that. Let's see where we're at. Perfect. Okay. So so we've heard so far from um, Judge Wood, Chief Judge. There's also Judge Williams, who's another circuit judge, and this is the other judge, Judge Rovner. Um, so let's have a look at what uh, Judge. Rovner added to what Judge Wood had already already explained about why she thought that uh, the decision was appalling by the majority. Interesting, isn't it? You've got one of the majority um, judges deciding to write an opinion, and yet two of the dissenting ones um, are quite happy to to um, weigh in. Okay, so. Um, Judge Rovner, Judge Wood and Williams dissenting. Uh, so this is Rovner saying this. I continue to believe, as I explained in the panel opinion and as Chief Judge Wood's dissent so persuasively argues, that the state court failed to fulfil the Supreme Court's mandate to review juvenile confessions with special care and unreasonably held that Dassey's confession was voluntary. And for all of the reasons upon which Chief Judge Wood has expounded and those set forth in the original panel opinion in Dassey versus Dittman, the regarding the unbank granted, opinion vacated, I too respectfully dissent. I write separately simply to point out the chasm between how courts have historically understood the nature of coercion and confessions and what we now know about coercion with the advent of DNA profiling and current social science research. And I would point out that there seems to be pretty much a chasm uh, between the judges themselves. Um, she carries on, although I write in the hope of encouraging courts to update their understandings of the factual nature of coercion, my conclusion about the proper outcome of Dassey's habeas petition does not depend on any change in law. 
current Supreme Court precedent requires that a court view the totality of the circumstances of any interrogation and to take special care when evaluating the confessions of juveniles to comply with the command of the Supreme Court. Therefore, a court must include within its evaluation of the totality of the circumstances, the impact of coercive interrogation techniques upon the particular vulnerabilities of the individual subject to those techniques. The state court did not do so in considering Das's appeal. For this reason, Das's conviction stannot, cannot stand. Unfortunately, four members of the seven-member armbank panel of this court do not agree. A decision that I believe has worked a profound injustice. Nevertheless, I hope to convince my colleagues throughout the courts that reform of our understanding of coercion is long overdue. When conducting a totality of the circumstances review, most courts' evaluation of coercion still are based largely on outdated ideas about human psychology and rational decision making. It is time to bring our understanding of coercion into the 21st century. Half a century ago, the Supreme Court held that police misrepresentations during interrogations, although relevant to a totality of the circumstances inquiry, were not in and of themselves sufficient to render an otherwise voluntary confession inadmissible. In other words, police may deceive, trick, conceal, imply, and mislead in any number of ways, provided that, under a totality of the circumstances evaluation, they do not destroy a suspect's ability to make a rational choice. C. ID, finding an interrogator's lie that a fellow suspect had confessed insufficient to make an otherwise voluntary confession inadmissible. And in another case in 1971, determining, determining that it was not per se coercive for police to send in a cooperating insurance agent to deceive the defendant into confessing to obtain insurance payments for his children. Trickery, deceit, even impersonation do not render a confession inadmissible. That was the Seventh Circuit back in 2009. Um, and in another state, another case, United States versus Rutledge, 1990, noting that the law permits the, the law permits the police to pressure and control, conceal material facts, and actively mislead all up to limits okay <clears throat> we already know that um, they like to use the word bluff as if it's as if it's some sort of friendly word you know bluffing it's it's like a little game it's far worse than that these cases however were born in an era when the human intuition that told us that innocent people do not confess to crimes was still largely unchecked this belief is rooted in the mind's tendency to assume that the statements made to a police officer that are against one's self-interest can be trusted or, to put it simply, the thought that most of us have that I would never confess to a crime I did not commit. Peer-reviewed studies confirm that jurors tend to have hard to dislodge beliefs that a suspect who is innocent could not be manipulated into confessing and in fact this false notion is precisely what the state implored the jurors in Das's trial to believe arguing in closing that people who are innocent don't confess we know however that this statement is unequivocally incorrect innocent people do in fact confess and they do so with shocking regularity of as of june 7th, 2016, the National Registry of Exonerations has collected data 
on 1,810 exonerations in the United States since 1989. That number, as of December 4th, 2017, is 2,132. And that data includes 227 cases of innocent people who falsely confessed. This research indicates that false confessions defined as cases in which undisputedly innocent individuals confess to a crime they did not commit occur in approximately 25% of homicide cases. And we notice some well-known names here like uh, Saul Kassan, uh, police-induced confessions, risk factors and recommendations. Nearly finished. In a world where we believe that innocent people do not confess to crimes they did not commit, we are willing to tolerate a significant amount of deception by the police. Under this rubric, the thinking went, the innocent person, or at least the vast majority of healthy, sane, innocent adults of average intelligence would not confess even in response to deception and cajoling. And so our case law developed in a factual framework in which we presumed that the trickery and deceit used by police officers would have little effect on the innocent. If it is true that, except in extreme cases, innocent people do not confess, what difference does it make to detectives Fassbender and Wiegert Make, made false assurances and used deception in interrogating Dassey. So what if they gave general insurances of leniency, used leading questions, fed Dassey information, lied about how much information they had, to told Dassey that they were on his side, implored him that honesty is the only thing that will set you free, suggested answers, and even went so far as to tell a confused and floundering Dassey that Teresa had been shot in the head. Dassey was not subject to physical coercion or any sort of threat at all, the majority tells us. And given the history of coercive interrogation techniques from which modern constitutional standards for confession emerge, this is important. But what do we do when the facts that supported our modern constitutional standards come from a 50 year old understanding of human behavior and when what we once thought we knew about the psychology of confessions we now know not to be true our long-held idea that innocent people do not confess to crimes has been appended by advances in dna profiling we know that, we now know that in approximately 25% of homicide cases in which convicted persons have later been unequivocally, unequivocally exonerated by DNA evidence, the suspect falsely confessed to committing the crime. The majority points out that that number of known false confessions is low compared to the total number of guilty pleas to violent felonies. This comparison is inappropriate for two reasons. First, the number of guilty pleas is the wrong denominator. Defendants plead guilty in all manner of situations, not only after interrogations by the police, as were was the case with Dassey. Many defendants, for example, accept a plea after carefully weighing their options with a lawyer without ever having been subject to a coercive interrogation. The only type of confessions with which we are concerned in this case. Moreover, and more importantly, in the numerator, the statistics for false confessions include only those who have been exonerated based on some form of objective evidence, DNA, impossibility, the confession of another, etc. The universe of, false, of people who falsely confess is 
undoubtedly larger than the subset of people who have been who have confessed and then been fortunate enough to have been exonerated by objective irrefutable evidence but most importantly as the majority concedes even one coerced false confession is very troubling indeed any coerced false confession is an affront to due process and cannot stand certainly human intuition makes it almost inconceivable to imagine that someone might falsely confess to the murder of one's own child yet in october 2004 kevin fox of wilmington illinois did just that he confessed to sexually assaulting his daughter placing duct tape over her mouth drowning her in the river and then going home to sleep His confession was detailed and included accounts of her moving and kicking in the water and struggling to remove the duct tape as she drowned. He quickly rescinded his confession but spent eight months in prison until DNA testing ruled him out as a suspect and the state of Illinois dropped the charges. Not only did the DNA alone exclude him as the suspect, but for any who had remaining doubts, the conviction of another man six years later made it unequivocally certain that his confession had been false. In 2010, Scott Eby, who was in prison for raping a relative, confessed to the murder. At the time of the murder, he had been living not far from the Fox home. While drunk and high on cocaine, Eby decided to rob some houses, and when he happened upon a sleeping Three-year-old Riley Fox, Fox, he abducted her, sexually assaulted her, and then drowned her to cover his crime. His DNA matched the, that found on the duct tape used to bind Riley. A pair of boots, which had been found at the scene, photographed, and then ignored for years, had the name Eby written on the tongue. Five decades ago, when the Supreme Court issued its opinions allowing interrogator deception, there was no DNA evidence that could demonstrate with such clarity that innocent people were confessing to crimes they had not committed at a surprising rate. And therefore, only a limited body of psychological science explaining why this happened. Even now, despite the overwhelming evidence regarding the coercive nature of constitutionally permissible interrogation techniques, we have not changed our understanding of how to view the facts surrounding coercion when evaluating the totality of the circumstances. Yet we now have a robust and growing body of rigorous, peer-reviewed legal and psychological research demonstrating how current interrogation tactics influence people and particularly juveniles and intellectually impaired people to act against their own self-interest in such a seemingly irrational manner. Some of the factors that induce false confessions are internal. Studies have demonstrated that personal characteristics such as youth, mental illness, cognitive disability, suggestibility and a desire to please others may induce false confessions. A survey of false confession cases from 1989 to 2012 found that although only 8% of adult exonerees with no known mental disabilities falsely confessed to crimes in the population of exonerees who were younger than 18 at the time of the crime, 42% of exonerated defendants confessed to crimes they had not committed, as did 75% of exonerees who were mentally ill or mentally disabled. Overall, one-sixth of the exonerees were juveniles, mentally disabled or both, but they accounted for 59% of false confessions. Indeed, youth and intellectual disability are the two most commonly cited characteristics of suspects who confess falsely. 
Dassey suffered under the weight of both characteristics. In addition to the factors specific to the suspect, some of the factors that include false confessions are externally imposed. These include isolation, long interrogation periods, repeated accusations, deception, presenting fabricated evidence, implicit, explicit threats of punishment or promises of leniency, and minimization or maximization of the moral seriousness or legal consequences of the offence. Maximization describes the technique whereby the interrogator exagger exaggerates the strength of the evidence and the magnitude of the charges. Das's interrogators employed maximization by constantly reminding Dassey, we already know everything. Huh. And look at, <laughs> look at the number of times at 17, 19, 23, 24, 26, 28, 30, 31, all the way through. Minimization describes tactics that are designed to lull a suspect into believing that the magnitude of the charges and the seriousness of the offence will be downplayed or lessened if he confesses. Studies demonstrate that minimization causes suspects to infer leniency to the same extent as if an explicit promise had been made, increasing not only the rates of true confessions from 46 to 81 percent in one experiment, but also the rate of false confessions from 6 percent to 18 percent. Although a court must exclude a confession obtained by direct promise of leniency, the research demonstrates that minimization techniques are the functional equivalent in their impact on suspects. The investigators in this case employed classic minimization techniques by repeatedly telling Dassey that it was not his fault that he committed the crime because his uncle, Stephen Avery, had made him do it. See various pages. As Chief Judge Wood points out in her dissent, interrogators in this case as in most police forces in the United States, used the Reed technique to obtain Dassey's confession. This technique involves isolation, confrontation, maximization, and minimization. The psychologically strong arm, psychological strong arm tactics that are known to produce coerced confessions, even in adults of average intelligence. Dassey's interrogation thus combined a perfect storm of these internal and external elements. He was young, of low intellect, manip manipulable, without a friendly adult and faced repeated accusations, deception, fabricated evidence, explicit, uh, implicit and explicit promises of leniency, police officers, disingenuously, I'm sure the dude loves that word, disingenuously assuming their role of father figure and insurances that it was not his fault. For many years, the Reed technique has been criticized by scholars and experts for increasing the rate of false confessions. As far back as Miranda, As far back as Miranda, the Supreme Court ruled that even without employing brutality, the third degree used in the re-technique exacts a heavy toll on individual limit liberty and trades on the weakness of individuals and may even give rise to a false confession. Recently, Wicklander, Zalowski and Associates, one of the nation's largest police consulting firms, said it will stop training detectives in the method it has taught since 1984, stating that it is not an effective way of getting truthful information. After a spate of high-profile false confession cases in the 1980s, Great Britain, hmm, we've covered this, Great Britain transitioned from an accusatorial and coercive read-like approach to an investigative model of interviewing which prohibits deception, coercion and minimization. 
well yes we've had a look at the peace technique which as they say is like a almost like an investigative journalist approach meta-analysis of 12 different laboratory experiments indicate that the accusatorial approach increased both true and false rates of confessions while the information gathering approach increased the rate of true confessions without also increasing false confessions no reasonable state court knowing what we now know about coercive interrogation techniques and viewing Das's interrogation in light of his age, intellectual deficits and manipulabil manipulability could possibly have concluded that Das's confession was given voluntary. Although it is my hope that our courts will, when evaluating the totality of the circumstances, engage with the more current understanding of coercion, as I noted at the start, Dassey does not need a change in our existing Supreme Court precedent or any existing law to prevail on his habeas position. What has changed is not the law, but our understanding of the facts that illuminate what constitutes coercion under the law. Moreover, even under our current anachronistic, hmm, anarch, anachronistic, I would say, anyway, um, outdated understanding of coercion, Das's confession was so obviously and transparently coercively obtained that it is unreasonable to have found otherwise. Dassey, however, need not rely on his finding on this finding either. Existing Supreme Court precedent allows for significantly deceptive and manipulative interrogation techniques, but those very techniques must then be evaluated in a totality of the circumstances analysis for what they are. The requirement that confessions must be voluntary is a principle at the heart of our legal system. Although psychological and physical torture and coercion are commonplace in some countries as a means of obtaining confessions, our system of justice rejects the notion that convictions can be obtained through such abuse. We refuse to accept such conduct as a means of obtaining information, not only because it impacts the veracity of the confession, but because it is conduct that we as human beings cannot tolerate from our own government. In a case such as this one, where investigators are faced with a crime of horrific brutality and the loss of a treasured life, the impulse to co coerce a confession from a suspect may be particularly strong. As judges, we are entrusted with the responsibility to protect against such abusive actions and uphold those principles that our Constitution protects, even in the darkest times. What occurred here was the interrogation of an intellectually impaired juvenile. Dassey was subjected to myriad psychological, psychologically coercive techniques, but the state court did not review his interrogation with the special care required by Supreme Court precedent. His confession was not voluntary and his conviction should not stand. And yet an impaired teenager has been sentenced to life in prison. I view this as a Profound miscarriage of justice. I respectfully dissent. And I'm pretty sure that's the end of that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'll say that was the final part of the looking at the, um, the whole of the document. Uh, the uh, majority decision by Hamilton which, you know, it seems, as I say, like he, he understands the law, um, but just cannot apply it um, properly. And we've looked at the two dissenting opinion, opinions from Wood and now Rovner. Um, Okie dokie. Um, during um yeah during marathon um as, as you might have noticed i've got some some guests lined up um 
let's start ladies first um certainly i know tracy keo is very keen to look very much at the uh, confession and to dig dig as, as deeply as, as we possibly can into into what's going on there um we've also got mr hodinet that's going to join us got some subjects lined up with him and rule and mr fleetside um as i say i'm just going to um finish this off and then in a couple of minutes i'm just going to set it up um and i'm going to look at something of, of interest to do with the first two episodes of um the innocence files so we'll catch you very shortly thanks for joining everybody um and we'll uh, yes we'll, we'll, we'll catch you very very soon bye for now